Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our water webinar, Make Your Own Watershed. Uh, today, uh, we are going to be talking about watersheds, what they are, uh, how you find your watershed address, water quality, and how we protect it. And uh, we're going to work through a step by step instruction on how to build a model watershed. Uh, your hosts today are myself, Rachel Rosenfeld, and the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Pennsylvania Sierra Club, and Sarah Corcoran, the For Forest Watch Coordinator for the Pennsylvania Sierra Club. And we're going to take you through um, this really fun, science-y, hands-on activity that you can do at home with materials that you find in your own kitchen. So you might be asking, what is a watershed? Well, a watershed is a area of land where all of the water running under it and over it drain into a body of water. And it combines with other watersheds to form a network of rivers and streams that drain into larger water areas. So as you can see in this image, when all the rain falls on the land, the water goes from the higher points to the lowest points, which are the valleys, and that forms the waterway. And as it flows over the landscape, it falls into a larger body of water at the bottom. And that could be a river, a lake, and eventually the ocean. And so you might be wondering, well, what are some of these other components of the landscape? And how do we determine where a watershed starts and stops? So with a watershed, you have your mountains and your high peak areas uh, that are separating different watersheds. Um, and so uh, everything um, on the lower end uh, is one watershed. And then on the other side of those mountains and peaks, you have your other watersheds. And as the water flows over those areas of land, and it, as it flows uh, down, it flows into larger bodies of water. At the top, you have your headwaters or your source waters. That's at the very top of your watershed, the highest point. And as those bodies of water, as those streams uh, come together, uh, that's considered a confluence where they meet. And then when it reaches the bottom or a larger body of water, such as a river or a larger stream, uh, that is the mouth of your waterway. And so you can see in this image here um, that we have all of those components listed. And if you are wondering where you might live or what watershed you live in. We want everyone to know that everyone lives in a watershed. And the best way to think about it is as if you have a funnel and the water drains to the bottom of the funnel. And so that's how we can think about it. And next I'm gonna hand it off to Sarah, who's gonna talk about how to find your watershed address. All right, so like Rachel said, everyone does live in a watershed. And if you think about it, water always has to go someplace. It always flows downstream, downhill from where it currently is. So if you think about water as being in a specific spot, you can give it an address. So I have a watershed address where my water flows from and goes to eventually you have a watershed address as well. And if you look at this slide, you can see my particular watershed address. Uh, I start out with when it rains, it goes from my property and flows downstream to the east branch of the Wallenpalpak Creek. From there, it goes to Lake Wallenpalpak, which drains into the Lackawaxen River, then to the Delaware River, the Delaware Bay, and all the way down to the Atlantic Ocean. So if something were to wash downstream from my location, it'll make its way all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, your, your watershed address will be a little bit different, but depending on where you're watching this video, 
you can see the different watersheds in Pennsylvania and where that water will eventually go. So we wanted to also uh, let you know that uh, we are, if you're watching this uh, from the Delaware River watershed, uh, that's where we are located at the moment. Um, and the Delaware River Basin is a very large area, covers four states spanning 13,500 square miles. So that's a very, very large area. Uh, and the other way uh, to think about a watershed is why it's important. Watersheds provide drinking water, they provide, uh, they support our economy, they support public health, and they support local wildlife populations. So, you know, keeping our watersheds healthy, especially the land on which the water is draining, keeping that area healthy is really important to protecting people, wildlife, and our health. So for this exercise, we wanted to lay out for you some of the things you might need. And we're gonna go through this step-by-step -step live, but just to give you an idea as you're collecting your materials, uh, what you might need. To start out with for your landscape, you'll be looking to have a large tray of some kind or bin to keep your water from splashing around and to keep all your materials in. Uh, some tin foil or saran wrap. You can even use a large trash bag to uh, cover it to create the forms um, in your landscape. Um, jars, cups, and bowls would be a good idea to create your mountains and your hills so that your landscape has some topography. Uh, you can use army men, Legos, any toy figures you have. Um, in this picture, I even have uh, some fruit that can also help to form your landscape. Um, and then some markers and a spray bottle. Sarah, do you wanna talk about the next one? Absolutely. So on top of your landscape, so the thing you're using to actually make your watershed, you'll need a couple of pollutants. We've split them into two different categories, your solids and your liquid pollutants. Um, and you don't need everything on this list. You can use whatever is on hand as long as it's lightweight and preferably brightly colored so you can see it really well um, when you're putting it onto your watershed. So some examples could be sprinkles or sugar crystals, Kool-Aid powder, uh, jello powder, cocoa powder, cinnamon. Um, you could use chocolate syrup or soy sauce. You could use a starch slurry, which is one of the things that I made because it's super duper bright. Um, but any, any of that type of thing, you'll also want something to um, represent trash. So sprinkles work really well for, for that, or you could just cut up little pieces of paper um, that, that, would, that would work as well. Um, as long as it's not something that can, that'll really be heavy, uh, anything will work. Use your imagination. Thank you, Sarah. So we just wanted to show you a quick example of what this will look like when you're finished. Uh, and this one in particular, uh, we went through some of the motions of adding our pollutants, um, but we'll, we'll walk you through that um, as we get to uh, the actual instruction. But we wanted to kind of give you an idea of what all of these components put together Will look like and you can see that there are elements um, that are taller and elements that are shorter um, and there's peaks and valleys to create that different um, uh, height and valleys and mountains that are on the landscape that you would you would see when you look outside so with that so far does anybody have any questions Hearing none at the moment, uh, we're gonna go into the instructions and we're gonna walk you through a live demonstration of putting together your watershed. 
and then we'll walk through a live demonstration of what happens on the landscape when you add pollutants and where does the water go? And then we will come back for more questions. So follow along with us or just watch our live demonstration and try it on your own. Um, but we hope that you uh, enjoy this project and your kids enjoy this project and we're really excited to share it with you. So hi everyone, again, this is Rachel and Sarah, hi. Sarah, and we are gonna start our demonstration. All right, so you will no longer be able to see me, um, but hopefully you'll be able to see everything that I'm working with here. So what I've got is a sort of cake carrying container. Um, it has uh, high sides on it so that when I put um, my landscape in here and I pour the water on top, uh, none of the water will escape. It's also plastic, which means that it'll be waterproof, but you're also welcome to use a baking tray or aluminum tin whatever you have um, that's large enough to fit all of your items. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna create the structure that goes underneath your waterway. Um, and I have a number of jars, mason jars work or um, old jars um, that you haven't recycled yet. Um, you can also use a variety of different bowls. Um, really anything that has sort of a, either a dome shape or a height to it um, that you can put your tin foil on top of. And so I'm just going to arrange these in my basin here. And I like to do a height order, but you can do it in whatever order you like, because uh, the landscape looks different for everyone. So I'm going to put my taller ones in the back because I want my water to flow forward. And I'll put my shorter ones in the back. So you can kind of see that there. All right, the next step is going to be to use either regular tin foil or plastic wrap uh, to cover your basin and your jars. And that will um, allow you to um, create the peaks and valleys to, for the water to run off. And I've chosen to use tin foil because I think that it works the best. And I've already pre-rolled out some sheets. You can tell I've used them before. And you're just going to want to press that into your basin on top of your um, jars and your bowls. Now mine's not going to be quite large enough to cover everything. So what I'm gonna do instead of uh, let the water accidentally run through is I'm gonna just put another piece on top. And it does make quite a lot of noise. And this is kind of a fun part. I think that your kids could really get into um, and you can help them with it can be a bit of a struggle. All right, so once your tin foil is nice and secure on top, um, we're gonna kind of decorate our landscape. So as you can see, you have a higher point and a lower point where the water will flow. And to that, we can either take permanent markers. I've got green and blue. You don't have to use them, but I think sometimes it's helpful um, to draw where the waterway will go. Um, and you can kind of take it and put it in between the jars where your valley is, which is where the water will flow. And now I've got it all marked. Then you can start to decorate your landscape with items that you have laying around, maybe some of your kids' toys. 
I unfortunately don't have a lot of toys, um, but what I do have are um, these little stoppers that kind of look uh, like they could be toys. I have a little Mr. T-Man and a little whale. And I'm gonna use this elephant to represent farm animal. I don't have any farm animals. So for my man, I'm gonna use him to represent a uh, residential community. I'm gonna put the residential community right here. You can put it anywhere on your landscape. And that's gonna represent like where you live, your house, your neighborhood, um, your street. Um, so where people live. Then um, you won't remember this, but this is gonna represent um, my manufacturing and factories. Um, here in the Lehigh Valley, we have a lot of warehouses and we used to have manufacturing with um, the uh, steel um, in Bethlehem. So I think I'm going to use this guy to represent um, uh, manufacturing and a plant. I also have a lot of golf courses around here. So I'm going to use this guy to represent a golf course. Um, golf courses have a lot of land of which over which water flows. And then to designate our water area, I'm gonna use our whale. You won't be able to see him when I put him in here, but he is there. We also have a lot of farmland. So pretend this is a cow. Um, we're gonna make our farms right here. And then um, I've also got some natural materials. You don't have to just use toys. Um, this is a little piece of a spruce tree and I've got some little pine cones and I'm gonna lay up here just to make it look a little bit more natural. I've also got a tree. We'll see if that works. All right. And so um, the only other thing that I'm going to use is um, we have a wastewater treatment plant in the Little Lehigh um, that uh, when you flush your toilet, all of your uh, all of the things in the toilet end up at the wastewater treatment plant or whenever you um, run any of your drains, all of your pipes in your house, the water flows to the wastewater treatment plant to be cleaned and treated. Um, so you can use a little bottle cap to represent the silo um, that is at the wastewater treatment plant that holds all of the yucky sludgy water. Um, and this would be a really great example um, of how uh, when it rains, um, how that might overflow. Sometimes they're filled up to the top. So that'll be uh, part of our example. And so um, this is gonna be your watershed. And um, in terms of pollutant materials that you can use, um, which is gonna be the next part, we're gonna make this a little dirty. Um, you can use cocoa powder or you can use cinnamon to represent uh, your soil. Um, on a landscape, you have a lot of soil and when soil is loose, it can run very easily. Um, so as we said in some in our um, slides, this is some of the material you can use. Um, you're also gonna want some um, something to represent trash. Um, there's a lot of trash on the landscape. So I use these colored sprinkles uh, you can also use crumpled bits of paper um, or other things to represent the trash that are colorful, but as also lightweight. Um, and then the other thing you're going to want is a number of different um, colored sprinkles or different colored sugar. Um, I have some plain sugar here, and I was just going to demonstrate that if you don't have um, colored sugar, you can use a little just a little bit of your food coloring and you can color that sugar. And it's almost as if you already had the dyed sugar. So here, I'll show you how easily that sugar turned red. See that? There you go. So now you have your one of your pollutants and this could either be your pesticides or this could be um, your fertilizer or it's gonna be your hazardous chemical waste, whatever you'd like to use it as. And then the last thing I'm gonna show you um, is our um, sort of our cornstarch slurry. So 
So I've uh, just put in here a little bit of um, food coloring into our cornstarch in our water. And I'm just gonna stir that up a bit. And Sarah has one that's green, so we're gonna work with green pollution. But I just uh, made red, which is the only food coloring I could find at the moment. So this is one of your liquid pollutants. You could also use um, soy sauce or hot sauce or, um, or anything like that that has a color to it or is viscous. Um, you could also use chocolate syrup or you could use soy sauce or oil, as we said before. Um, and I'm gonna let Sarah take away um, how to use some of these materials on your landscape. All right, so, ta-da, kitchen, uh, kitchen show chic. I've already got my little watershed here, and um, it may be a little bit difficult to see some stuff right now, but I'll move the camera around so you can see it in a little bit. Um, I do happen to have a lot of toys in my house, um, using a couple of my son's little toys right now to demonstrate uh, different parts of the watershed. So I've got my community up here. Um, lots of people live in communities in this area and it could be that you have a standalone home, but this is going to represent where we have a lot of people together. Uh, we have a lot of forests in the Poconos. Um, there are also some construction sites, so I'll put a uh, little concrete mixer there for a construction site. Lots of agriculture. Wayne County has lots and lots of farms, and so does some of the other areas in, in, around here. I also have a duck for our water and a shark. We don't really have sharks in Northeast Pennsylvania, but um, there are some pretty large fish in the lakes, so we can, we can say that. So there's some of my nice little props that I'm going to use for this. And Rachel talked about our different things that we can use as a pollution source. And um, there are lots of lots of different ways that we can pollute our landscape, unfortunately. But there are two main different ways that we can designate those pollution sources. There is point source and non-point source pollution. So point source, just like the name implies, is something that you can point to. It's a source of pollution that you know exactly where it came from. Now that's gonna be mainly your factories or your um, construction sites, maybe a little bit, but um, your pipelines, anything where you can see pollution actively being put into your watershed. Um, Non-point source pollution is a little bit more tricky. You kind of know where it's coming from, but you don't know the exact source. So um, it's a little bit harder to stop. Now, with our different sources of pollution, I have some cinnamon, I have some colorful sprinkles, and I have some flaxseed, um, all nice lightweight things. And then I have my slurry. I'm going to use my pink sprinkles here as um, fertilizer and pesticides. Uh, you have quite a bit of fertilizer and pesticides in your farm communities, in your, um, if you have a nice green lawn, you might use some pesticides or some fertilizers. So I'm gonna sprinkle some of that on our community. And don't worry if some of it goes down into your waterways while you're sprinkling it, that's okay. Um, let's see. There's going to be, I haven't designated what this is going to be yet, this little hill here. So we'll make that a golf course. Because there are a couple of golf courses up here. We might as well. Um, and that's going to be a large swath of green grass. You know, it's not exactly um, a very diverse area. Now, we are also going to have a little bit of trash. When you have people, you have trash. So wherever there are people about in our construction site, in our communities, at our golf courses, we'll put a little bit of trash. And I'm just using little bits of ripped up paper 
um, right now, but you can use whenever you'd like to, to represent trash. Uh, one thing though, I do say, please do not use glitter. Um, glitter is of itself a source of pollution. It's made up of tiny little pieces of plastic that washes downstream. So we do not want to use glitter if we can help it. Um, let's see. I will then use my cinnamon as erosion, as sedimentation. So um, if you have a construction site, for example, you're going to have some exposed soil. And now that soil is going to wash downstream when it rains. If you are, um, if you are on a farm and you are tilling up the soil and planting new crops, you might have some erosion happening there. Um, if there's a new building going in in a community, there's a little bit of construction happening. So there's some erosion going on there. And then a big one, we have a lot of timber harvesting in this area. So I'm going to boop off this tree and put some sedimentation there too. Ooh, that cinnamon smells good. Um, let's see. Another source of pollution that we have in this region, how many of you drive or ride in cars or buses or trains? They all have gas and oil that they leak on the roadways and that's not good. I'm going to use this slurry here for my roadways. So you're going to have a little bit in our community. I just love how this this starch slurry kind of like goes everywhere. And you're going to have a little bit near the construction site where the vehicles are coming in and out. You're going to have a little bit at the timber site and the golf course. Not a lot. And you might have just a tiny, tiny smidge at your farm. People like to drive around. There's a lot of cars on the road. And if you're thinking about roadways, in the winter, what do we put on our roads? Salts. So I'm going to use some of this flaxseed here for salt on the roads. It doesn't exactly look like salt. If you wanted to use like white sugar crystals or just regular sugar or actual salt, you could do that as well. But it just doesn't show up as nice. So um, when salt gets into our waterways, it makes things more salty. Um, it makes it difficult for the fish and the insects that live in the water to survive. So we don't want to put too much salt on our roads. Um, but if you look at our lovely, disgusting watershed now, if I can get it. There we go. You'll see that there's lots of greens and lots of browns and pinks on that watershed. Now, what do you think is going to happen when it rains? Now, this is a super duper fun part. And um, if you want to put down a towel underneath your watershed, it might not be a bad idea, especially if you're going to have a little spraying or little at heart, um, because it can get a bit messy. Um, another thing we didn't mention when you're making your watershed, if you want to go at a larger scale and have cars in your watershed or any other sort of toys or displays for things that can be pollutants, you can always do this watershed demonstration in a bathtub. And it makes very easy cleanup then. Um, and you can be as messy as you want to be. Um, now. I'm going to make it rain. And as we're making it rain, it might take a little bit to get it going at first. But we're going to just... If you use multiple pieces of tin foil, some of it might get into cracks and might float underneath a little bit. And that's okay. Because in a natural watershed, sometimes it doesn't all flow downstream right away. Sometimes it soaks into the ground. So keep spraying away. 
I went a little heavy handed with my oil. And you don't have to worry about getting it all off of your watershed. Because it doesn't always make it downstream on the first go around. But I think that's I think that's enough. That pig got a good bath. So I'm gonna take my little things off. And I'll show you our new watershed. Let's see. I can get it better than last time. So that is now our watershed. And look at that. Look at our look at our pool of water down here. Does that look very tasty? That looks uh that looks pretty gross. So when you're thinking about the pollution going downstream and it ending up in our streams and our lakes and our rivers, you don't really want to go swimming in that or drink that or um, play around in that at all because it's really gross. But there are ways that we can cut back on the amount of pollution that ends up in our watersheds. And I'm going to turn the camera back over to Rachel now, so that way she can talk about some of the best management practices, uh, big fancy words for things we can do better to make sure that the pollution doesn't make its way into our rivers. Take it away, Rachel. Thank you, Sarah. One second. Um, let's figure, okay. All right. So I hope everyone can see everything I've got here. Um, Try to back up my camera a little bit. All right, so I still have my watershed completely set up. Um, but I'm gonna add a little bit of pollution to mine and talk about how there are opportunities that we can use through nature to actually uh, prevent that pollution um, from reaching our waterways, like you find the example that Sarah did. So I'm going to do a little bit of a chocolate syrup into, remember that silo from our wastewater treatment plant? I'm going to fill that up with some grossness from our pipes. I'm going to add some fertilizer with some green uh, sugar to our golf course. doesn't matter if it gets everywhere. It's okay. It's also in our residential areas a little bit. Remember that uh, little slurry that we made that was red, Sarah's was green. We're gonna add a little bit of that to our factory. And then I'm gonna use cinnamon as my soil. And you find cinnamon pretty much everywhere. Or cinnamon, you find soil pretty much everywhere. Hopefully I would be excited if there was cinnamon everywhere. All right. And lastly, I'm just going to put, oops, getting it everywhere. I'm going to put a little bit of the red sugar that I made um, down as a, uh, um, as like a pesticide. Oh, yeah, there we go. And I almost forgot, I need a little bit of the trash too. Okay, so when it comes to our green infrastructure uh, or our na natural methods for preventing pollution from reaching our waterways, we're going to use a sponge. Now, I have a plant-based sponge, kind of why it looks kind of weird. Uh, it's made with plant fibers, but you can use a regular sponge. It's okay. Um, and I actually cut it up into little pieces, if you can see that. Um, but I'm going to use these as... Um, to soak up the pollution. Essentially, our natural methods that we use are called riparian buffers. They are um, an area between a waterway and the pollutant, um, which could be your agriculture, could be your factory, could be um, your farm, um, between that area of land and your waterway um, that 
prevents the pollution from getting uh, to your waterway. And it's made up of all kinds of native plants, which are really good at preventing the pollution from moving in the watershed uh, because they have really long roots. They're really adapted well to the climate. They, they live really well there and they really like to soak up water uh, and they're good at filtering that water before it gets to your landscape or it gets to your stream. So I'm creating, I'm gonna move you a little bit closer. Pretty sure you can see that. So you see what I created here are these little strips or buffers in front of each pollutant area to prevent the pollution from getting to our waterway. You can also use little strips of um, paper towel. I cut up a few. Um, they work really well at soaking up the pollutant as well and you can kind of roll them a little bit. There's multiple different types of green infrastructure. Um, you can have this represent uh, other things. Some of them are called uh, swales. Um, that's usually, uh, you can see those in a parking lot or um, along uh, commercial property um, that's used to kind of funnel the water um, to a larger area or a basin. Um, but if they're vegetated, then they'll soak up a lot of those pollutants before they get there. So I'm gonna put some of these at the top of my watershed. And remember the idea here is using plants, specifically native plants. All right, so we're gonna see how this works. If this is able to prevent the pollution from moving through my landscape. So I've got my spray bottle here. So I'm applying a lot of water, but my wastewater treatment plant silo isn't spilling over. And you can see all of the um, pollution behind the buffer next to my plant is not going into my waterway. The cinnamon smells really good, by the way. I recommend using cinnamon. All right, so let me give you a little tour and show you that, can you see my waterway? It doesn't really have a lot of pollution in it. Most of the pollution is actually back here and it sort of got stuck behind those buffers. So the idea here is just trying to demonstrate that when you use native plants and you use these, um, these best management practices to prevent the pollution from getting to your waterway and you slow down the flow of the water, um, you actually keep your water a lot healthier and cleaner uh, for the macroinvertebrates and the aquatic life and the fish that live there. Um, one other um, thing that I don't have to show you here um, is the idea of a fence. Um, that you can put in your agricultural areas um, to prevent your livestock from going into your stream. Um, a pollutant I don't have on my landscape today, but is often on our landscape, um, is, uh, you know, animal and livestock waste. Um, too much manure, too much um, uh, animal or livestock waste um, has a lot of nitrogen in it, and that can act as a pollutant in your waterways so when animals trudge through the water, um, that can be detrimental. So putting a farm, uh, putting a fence in your farm um, can be really helpful at slowing that pollution down as well. Um, so we hope that um, these methods were, um, are helpful for you in learning how best to protect your waterway. And I'm gonna um, let Sarah come back on here because we're gonna talk about um, just in general, some ways that you can um, employ some of these practices at home when it's raining and you want to protect your waterway because all of the water that rains down from the sky over your house, on your driveway, and on your streets 
um, flows into a storm drain and ends up in your streams. So I don't know, Sarah, do you want to add some key pointers here about what people can do at home? Absolutely. So Rachel made a key point of using native plants um, for her buffers, for her riparian zones. Um, and that is something that you can easily do at home as well when you're planting your gardens or maybe edging your driveway or any of those things. Um, the native plants have deeper root systems, so they tend to soak up a little bit more of the water that you have going on. Uh, cutting back on the size of your yard, uh, because even though grass is green, it often acts more like an impervious surface, which we didn't really talk about pervious and impervious surfaces, but um, it doesn't allow the water to soak down into the earth as easy. Um, so if you used um, other types of vegetation instead of that nice green grass that you have to water and keep pretty, um, that, is, that is another way of cutting back on uh, pollution in our waterways. You could, if you, if you did have to do um, a timber harvest or you needed to cut down some trees, instead of clear cutting an area or taking a whole bunch of trees at once, you could do a selective harvest, which will um, allow you to still take some trees, but will leave the surrounding area still, still pretty healthy. Um, you could do rain gardens. Rain gardens are always nice. Um, you could do a, have a rain barrel on your property. Um, Rachel, is there anything else that I'm missing right now? No, I think you um, pretty much covered a lot of options. Um, the only other thing I guess would be, you know, to think about, um, you know, having some uh, water friendly practices in your garden. So thinking about not using any fertilizer, or if you have to use fertilizer, limit the amount of fertilizer you're using or use more natural products. Um, when it when the leaves are on the ground, um, you know, leave them there. They do provide food for your um, for the critters that, that live on your land. But um, in order to prevent them from getting to your um, storm drains and clogging up uh, the storm drains or reaching the stream and adding extra leaf detritus to the stream, um, you could also think about kind of shredding them and using them in your beds specifically um, to help keep uh, nutrients flowing to your plants. Um, and then other things are, you know, cleaning out your gutters, um, you know, cleaning out a storm drain if you see that there's plastics. Um, I know it's been pretty windy in my, my house recently and uh, we saw a number of pieces of trash uh, on a walk that we did around the neighborhood. So just being um, vigilant of all of those different things. That, that reminded me as well, if you live in a more rural area, please remember to bring your trash inside or put it in a shed because wind is an issue, but also bears and other scavenging creatures like raccoons and possums can get into your trash and um, become litter bugs. Uh, if you have a farm uh, another way that you could cut back on that erosion from um, from tilling your property is to switch your, your farming practices over from um, tilling the soil completely to low-till or no-till where you leave some of last year's crops left behind and use that as um, a nutrient base. Um, there's, there's all sorts of things. Cleaning up after your pet if you happen to have a dog and you like to take walks with them in public areas, um, cleaning up after your pet, it's just like a very small cow. Um, it still leaves nutrients behind that can end up in our waterways. So there's lots of things that you at home can do. I've got one more. I just thought about it because I'm in my kitchen. And one you don't tend to think about often um, is the things that go down your drain. Uh, I did mention is the wastewater treatment plant. You know, the only thing we really want to be flushing is toilet paper. And, um, you know, so right now, um, you know, the other thing is now that we're home and we have a lot of time to cook, be careful about putting um, cooking oils um, down your drain um, because they do actually clog up the drains. They can cause pipe bursts. And if they get to the wastewater treatment plant, they can clog up um, machinery. So, um, you know, these are a couple other things that you can think about as you're trying to protect our waterways, um, protect our watersheds, and protect our water quality.
Um, it's important even if you don't live in an area that has wastewater treatment plants, if you have a turkey mound in your backyard and you're pouring oil and grease and all sorts of nastiness down your drain, it's eventually going to clog your pipes and you could have a septic backup and that is never fun, especially this time of year when we're getting all of the excessive rain. You really don't want to um, be adding that into our watershed. Yeah, so with that, um, we thought we'd leave it open to any questions that anyone has. And uh, we thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We had a really great time uh, building these model watersheds with you. And we hope that your watershed uh, building goes just as well. And if not, you know, it's always, uh, you can break this down. Everything in here is waterproof and rinse it in the sink and then rebuild it. Uh, we've done ours a couple times now. Um, so, and I wanted to also mention that if you do decide to make a watershed uh, based on our model or your own model, um, please share your pictures with us. We'd love to, to see your watersheds and your creativity and uh, how much fun you have learning about water. So um, yeah, please share them with us. But again, any questions that anyone has, uh, we're happy to answer them. All right, well, if there's no questions at this time, you can always reach one of us um, through our emails. Um, and like I had the slide up earlier, I'll just reshare it as we close out our video. So here again is our contact information. So if anyone um, has a question and you'd like to reach one of us and ask more about uh, a watershed or ask more about um, pollutants on the landscape or how to prevent uh, and prevent uh, stormwater pollution or how to um, protect water while at home, please reach out to one of us. We're available and interested and happy to talk to you. So thanks again for joining us today. Uh, again, this is Rachel Rosenfeld with Sierra Club and Sarah Corcoran, also with the Sierra Club. And we we're really happy you could, you could join us today. So thank you so much. Now get out there and make some watersheds.